The views and opinions expressed by the guests of the Inspira podcast do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of any agency of the United States government or any organization, public or private. Welcome to the Inspira podcast, hosted by your girl, me, Erica Mueller Chen. I'm an international development specialist with over a decade of experience leveraging the amazing power of sport to promote peace and positive social impact. My career has allowed me to live in Europe, Southern Africa, and Latin America. In 2022, I accepted an offer for my dream job in sports diplomacy. And I also became an employee family member to a U.S. diplomat, a.k.a. an EFM. This podcast is all about inspiration and career advice. Each episode, I'll interview an inspirational global changemaker working in sport for development, social impact, or the diplomatic service. This series is perfect if you have interest in breaking into one of these sectors or you've already landed that dream role and are keen to learn from thought leaders. Enjoy today's episode and stay inspired. In this space, I feel like I'm in prison. Like I am suffocating and feel terrified because I have no power whatsoever to get out of this out of this place, all for women to play. But the paradox was the women that were playing, it was their space of freedom and liberation because they had the safety to do it in a context that was relevant to them. Welcome friends. Today's guest is Dr. Sarah Hillier. Dr. Sarah is the founder of the University of Tennessee's Center for Sport, Peace and Society. The mission of the center is to create a more peaceful, equitable and inclusive world through powerful intersection of sport and education. In the summer of 2022, the center celebrated its 10 year anniversary with some truly amazing and Sarah, I mean, amazing achievements ranging from a 10 year partnership with Department of State to implement the very powerful global sports mentorship program, as well as being awarded the Stuart Scott Humanitarian Award by ESPN and publishing a book and two podcasts to celebrate Title IX's 50th anniversary. And on a personal note, Dr. Sarah, you're just such a special person in my journey who I just consider an amazing mentor and friend ever since we first met, I think back in 2015. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. How are you and where are you calling us from? Ah, you're so sweet. It's so good and such an honor. And I'm so stinking proud of you and what you've done and like what you're putting into the world. Um, surprisingly, I'm actually at home in Knoxville, Tennessee. So just <laughs> south of Knoxville and Loudoun. Um, so yeah, I'm proud to be here and, and so grateful for the University of Tennessee for allowing us this platform. Well, I like to start my conversations with a reason why my guest inspires me. Your lifelong dedication to this sector, especially mm -hmm. to empowering women and refugees and people with disabilities is incredible and so important. And you're also one of the few podcast guests who have actually met in person. And when reflecting, I was like, I've spent time with you in three different countries. We met mm -hmm. in Turkey, we <laughs> worked together in Brazil, and then of course in the United States. And I don't even know if there's certain family members or friends that I've spent time with in more than one country. So it's uh, <laughs> just been a wonderful journey that I've been able to share parts of it with you and vice versa. So um, yeah, you're just an amazing inspiration to the sector and to me and everything that you keep giving, whether it's your energy or like the literal practical programs that empower and create leaders worldwide. Mm, thank you, Erica. Okay, so 16th floor, Istanbul, Turkey, working on uh, like the disability, like manual adapted sport for all of Ooh. Iran and physical education teachers. I will never forget the 16th floor, maybe it was 17th, but anyway, a lot of magic happened on that floor um, on that project. And that was like, it's such a special memory. 
Dr. Sarah, to kick things off, perhaps I can ask you to give us an overview of your career journey and any special moments or reasons why you really decided to focus on sport for social change. Yeah, I think um, for me, it's like a journey of entrepreneurship, um, but of really unintended. So I played college basketball at Virginia Tech. Um, I fresh, I came from a small town in Kentucky of 800, uh, felt so proud to represent this town, going to a division one school and getting a basketball scholarship and honestly kind of felt the weight of the community on my shoulders because it was, I would have never been able to afford education at Virginia tech uh, otherwise, and, and such an opportunity. So basketball really opened the door for me to pursue educational pathways that otherwise I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. When I got there, it was a it was a different experience. And I, you and I have talked about this. Um, I always viewed sport as like such a transformational um, entity in personal lives coming from a small town. And I saw the way it brought the community together. I saw the way that it provided opportunities for, for girls, you know, like me and even guys that otherwise wouldn't have had chances almost in an upward social mobility kind of way. Um, but when I got to college in the division one level, I quickly realized and kind of questioned the NCAA's mission statement that it's about the holistic development of a student athlete. And like, what does that mean? And, but the practical side of that and, and no judgment, like I get that it's a business, um, but it was, a, it was, it was about transactions. It was very transactional rather than what I had experienced and really saw sport as, as being transformational. So I wrestled with that. So I, I, I had a college coach that had, I mean, this was in the late eighties, early nineties, had me weigh in every morning. Um, but she never told me how much I had to weigh. And so, uh, you know, like I'd show up and one day it would be 137 and one day it would be 142 and one day it'd be 135. And, so it stripped all control, which is athletes, like that's the one thing you have control of is your body, right? Your, your physicality and you train and train and train. So when all that control was stripped and then it began to like mess with your mind, um, I, I ended up like skipping classes, going to the gym, putting on a garbage bag, running, um, not eating all day because I would have a chance to weigh in again at two o'clock to see if I would make weight. And if I did, I could practice or play in the game. And it wasn't like I was last woman off the bench either. I was six woman off the bench. I was freshman of the year. And the, with the time it was the Metro conference. Um, and so, but for me, it, it was more destructive than empowering. And because I would skip classes, go in a garbage bag, bike or run all day, not eat all day so I could make weight. And then at night I would eat everything I could. And then I would throw it all up because I knew the, the pattern was just going to start again. And so after a year and a half of that, I was, I was in trouble. I mean, I was really struggling with the relationship to food. So I transferred schools. I finally had the courage to tell my parents, like, this is not a healthy environment. I was so scared to disappoint them. They said, listen, Sarah, basketball is not who you are. It's what you do, who you are. Wow. Like God has created you for a much bigger purpose. So go get out of this. We don't care if you play basketball. We want you to be healthy and whole and like make contributions to this world and fulfill God's purpose for you. So I transferred schools. I went to Liberty University just to re-engage with my faith. But the eating, like the eating challenges didn't just go away. So when I graduated, I told my parents driving home eight hours on the way home to Kentucky after I got my diploma, I, I promised I will never, ever, ever have anything to do with sports again the rest of my mm -hmm. life. And they were like, we support you. Mm -hmm. However, <laughs> you do have a degree in sports administration. <laughs> okay. So the next year they let me live at home and, and I just kind of got my feet under me again. And I remember waking up one morning and had kind of this clarity of thought that I hadn't had in, in this fog of battling. I don't, I mean, I can't say it was like clinically an eating disorder, but it was a struggle. Um, and the epiphany was, wait a minute, Sarah, like sport didn't do this to you. Basketball didn't do this to you. It's what someone in a position of power did. Wow. And if she had the power to cause destruction, you have the power to give hope, 
and purpose and identity and something much greater than like the chase of championship banners and rings and gold medals. So I started a nonprofit organization called Sport for Peace and started taking female student athletes and former student athletes around the world. We funded it on bake sales and car washes and I was a substitute teacher and <laughs> stock shelves at a chemical warehouse and umpired and refereed and did everything, anything I could for almost 15 years. Mm. Um, but in those 15 years, I saw the transformative power of sport in lots of different cultures. First of all, it started in South America, then it went to Central Asia. And then all of a sudden, I, I found myself with partners working in Iran and the Middle East as like the first and only American woman to go into the Islamic Republic of Iran officially wow. to do sport since 1979 Islamic Revolution. And I had the gift of working with a partner organization over 10 years to help build out the women's like the Islamic Federation of Women's Sports, develop women's softball in Iran. And then that kind of expanded to Iraq and Saudi Arabia in places where politically and um, like policy wise were much larger than bake sales and car washes. So I thought, ah, <laughs> I think I might need to skill up. I don't think I can continue to scale and sustain this. I'm going to go back to school, which is what led me to the University of Tennessee to get a PhD in sports sociology. Wow. Well, I certainly didn't do your biography justice knowing you built a sport in the Middle know. East and all these other things. And uh, that's the power of sport <laughs> to open crazy doors, right? Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for, for sharing your story, especially how sport was not a positive experience for you at that time in your life, because I've found that a lot of my interviews and even just casual conversations with people who really believe in the power of sport, they relate that to the power, the positive power it had in their life. And usually that's because of a positive role model, a positive coach, positive friends. And so it's a really important thing for people to think about and to know and i just appreciate your your vulnerability and sharing that and um how you were able to or how your parents rather it sounds like they helped you see that sport wasn't who you were it was something that you did and that's a really important thing for any athletes and so quick follow-up question on like the student athlete side of things i know you've done so much work at university of tennessee with student athletes do you feel like the experience is getting better for them this next decade or is it just kind of a new set of challenges that are going to come to our youth there are emerging leaders because yeah. it's such a it, it's hard being a student athlete it is um and like it is such a gift and and now with nil with like name image and likeness the world is changing right like now you have a little more power uh you can monetize whether it's for profit or for non-profit reasons and you you have a yeah. different platform you feel um less owned i guess like it gives you a little bit of your autonomy back now it doesn't mean that there's not a ton of challenges involved in that i also think with uh you know in in really i think covid had a lot to do with this is it allowed athletes professional and student athletes to really like scale back zoom out and put in perspective the relevancy of sport in our like human lives. Like at the end of the day, there's a lot of hurting. There's a lot of suffering. There's life and death. There's things much bigger than wins and losses and gold medals and championship rings, as I said earlier. Um, and then a, a number of like social, like really pressing social kind of things emerged, uh, at least in the American culture, which in this weird intersection of COVID gave athletes and student athletes an opportunity to really reflect on social justice issues and to realize that their unique passion for sport, but their unique platform as an athlete um, allowed them to speak to larger so pressing social issues yeah. in a different way than they ever had. And so I do think the tide is shifting. I think in order for it to really shift that leadership uh, needs to be keenly aware of the power of the platform of athletes within sport um, to make a difference and to have a voice 
around things that are much bigger and larger and more important um, than the actual pursuit of, of what we uh, strive to achieve in sports as an end in and of itself. Yeah, it's it's interesting to watch it. I mean, I'm removed from the student athlete bubble. And of course, University of Tennessee, Knoxville certainly has a different sports culture than when I went to Brown in terms of how sport is viewed and how important it is. I, I know it's a lot more important to your campus than maybe it was to mine. And uh, yeah, just the nuances that come with that. Um, so I would love to know a little bit more about your work in the Middle East. And I actually thought of a new question while you were talking because you mentioned mentioned at the time you may have been the first or the only American woman in these spaces and oftentimes when I'm speaking to leaders who have been in the sector we talk about how important it is to center the community in the work and especially as mm -hmm. you and I are white American women in these spaces there's a certain sensitive approach that is really essential to that and I'm kind of wondering if that's what you felt in those spaces or I'm wondering if the cultural nuances really came into play and the gender norms in terms of how women's voices were used or perhaps how they weren't used. Did you kind of fill a niche where you could have a voice and you could kind of use your identity to say things that other people couldn't say? Like, what were was that interaction in terms of your role and your identity and just how you could utilize being in those spaces in order to support local people and local women? Mm, it is such a good question. So certainly there were opportunities or moments where they, you know, just really sought out and leaned on my expertise coming from America. But I fully kind of Heismaned that <laughs> in the sense that like, I, I can't speak for your cultural context. And so I really led with question after question after question. Um, they were the greatest teachers and mentors to me. And I think the, the most, like, interesting and fun part of that was really co-creating sports experiences for women and girls within those cultural contexts, especially within the Islamic context, to say, okay, like, how does this work? How am I respectful of the Quran, the Hadiths? Um, you know, how do we do this in a way that is sustainable for the cultural and religious context in which you're doing? And to be honest, like, especially if we take the, the context of 10 years in Iran, uh, I learned so much because the, the women and men's sports systems are segregated, right? So, to go to a women's volleyball game or a women's basketball game or now women's softball after we started that, um, there are no men allowed, none. So there's not a male coach, a male referee, a male like uh, trainer. Like there's no, there's no men in that space. And it, it takes me back to um, AIAW, um, like before the NCAA, when mm -hmm. women's sports were led by women for women. And so since the NCAA, and of course, there's been a lot of advances with scholarships and, you know, so many opportunities for women that then go on to play in the pros. But on the flip side of that, after 50 years of Title IX, there are more men coaching, more men making money um, than women. And so in some ways it caused me to have this like cultural comparison of wait are are the iranians doing this right mm -hmm. and doing it in a way that it's like no no this is all women for women because women know best for women and then it's like men because as soon as the ncaa and title nine happened and all of a sudden salaries increased for for women's sports and coaching and administration then men filtered over into the women's game to pursue the economic opportunities with a disconnect between like what, what it means for women to have this opportunity and no disrespect. Like I have so much respect for women and I do believe that like all of this is a two wing bird and we need both. But having had those experiences in Iran, it did cause me to reflect a lot. Like, uh, I can't say that as Americans, we're doing it the right way or the best way and that we should be exporting that 
Um, so I learned a lot from them and brought a lot of those principles back um, to my own coaching career and, and now as an educator. Mm, that's so interesting. And uh, this isn't about me, but it makes me think about when I moved to South Africa and everybody gave me this instant trust. And I was like, whoa, like this is not what I deserve. <laughs> and um, I'm glad that it was someone like you in that experience. And hopefully the mentors I had when I was in a different cultural context where I had this uh, potential to influence, this potential to do something because, um, yeah, that, that's a lot of responsibility. So yeah, I like your high. Heisman <laughs> reaction to that and just working side by side and taking that as learning and figuring out how to support Iran in the best way that you and the local stakeholders could. And then, of course, in the U.S. spaces that you're in, just reconciling with figuring out what works in the sporting um, context mm -hmm. and why it exists in the way that it does and especially that gender aspect. Yeah. Let me share a quick story about Iran. So it was the very first trip I had been there and my only like my only knowledge about Iran was like childhood images of black and white television from the 1980s, like hostage crisis. Like I remember mm. the Marines being blindfolded. And so when I went, I was completely ignorant for better or worse. And I'm willing to admit that. And I learned so much. Um, but when I went, the very first gym that they took me to was to a women's volleyball practice. And so we went in this gym I didn't have any idea. Like I, in my mind, there was like, Oh, what am I here for? There's no women's sports here. Like, you know, we're, we're starting from scratch. So I went to a gym, we got in, I had been hanging out with these women for like three or four days, um, just in a social context and at other venues and academic settings. But then when we went to the gym and it was finally time for training, we went in and then there was a woman that was the gym manager and she was covered in like the full black chador, the traditional Iranian chador. Uh, we got inside and she dead bolts the door locked and like sticks her key like down in her chador. And so like I, I'm trapped. So for me, there's um, bars on the windows. The windows are blacked out. Um, it's just women. And there is one woman that can let me in or out of that place. So in my American brain, I'm thinking this is a fire safety hazard. <laughs> this would not be allowed at best, <laughs> at best, right? Like it, God forbid something happens to that lady. But what happened was, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm waiting for volleyball practice to start and the women start to take off their, their, um, their hijab their manto, like all of their like exterior garb and the more layers that they take off, like now they're down to Nike or Under Armour spandex, like sports bras and like tights with like these chiseled abs and shoulders and <laughs> arms. And they go step out on the volleyball court and they're like 25 to 40 inch verticals smashing the ball and like living their best life. And the paradox for me as an American woman was like in this space, I feel like I'm in prison. Like I am suffocating and feel terrified because I have no power whatsoever to get out of this, out of this place, all for women to play. But the paradox was the women that were playing, it was their space of freedom and liberation because they had the safety to do it in a context that was relevant to them. So it was so profound for me to say in a space that as an American, I feel trapped, confined, claustrophobic, suffocated, imprisoned. They find liberation, freedom, power, and autonomy over their own bodies because on the outside, they had very little control over their own bodies, which were required to be covered. But inside, they had full control of their bodies and were amazing athletes. And that was the beginning of our tenure relationship to really build out women's sports in the Islamic context. Quick break here to highlight what I consider to be a fabulous resource that I've created for any listeners out there interested in learning more about the sport for development and peace sector. You've come to the right place. In addition to Inspira podcast episodes that you can listen to, 
I've created a written resource that you can read, which currently has over 90 items I've curated from my own experience and vetted with other experts in the field. These include databases to find award-winning organizations, links to reports, books, and research, as well as recommended newsletters and recorded webinars, all Sport for Dev related. I encourage you to have a look. You can find this resource by visiting my link tree listed in each episode's show notes, then clicking Erica's Global Resource Hub. That's right, Erica's Global Resource Hub. If you like what you read and what you hear, I'd love it if you could give Inspira a five-star review on your chosen podcast platform and write a kind review. That would be so energizing for me and it would help Inspira reach more ears. Thanks and back to the show. Wow, that's an incredible story and reflection that you can remember so vividly. So vividly. it's it's incredible. And, and I love the paradox that you're able to draw between those two. And it um, just makes me think even more about how even though sport transcends these mm-hmm. borders, these boundaries, social and physical, it does not and cannot function in the exact same way in different settings. And so that also I know has been such a part of your journey because you've worked in and with so many different cultures. Mm -hmm. Are there any things that come to mind just about the differences where you're like, oh, like that would never work in Tennessee, but oh, it's working somewhere else. Like there's a lot that wouldn't work in Tennessee, let's be honest. Um, I mean, I think another interesting experience was going with a partner organization of ours. And I, I'm so grateful for the opportunities that, that they provided um, to uh, Saudi Arabia. And it was ahead of the 2012 London Games. So if you remember those conversations, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, was really like clamping down on Saudi Arabia to say, if you don't send a female athlete uh, to the Olympic Games, we're going to ban any of your men's teams and eligibility. So I had the privilege with this amazing partner organization to go to Riyadh. And I was one of four in our American delegation that was visiting the Saudi Olympic Committee. I was the only woman. So I'll never forget, we drove into the Olympic Committee complex uh, we got to the security gate. Of course, there's men there. They've got guns. Um, they lean their head in the door and they're like, uh, I'm sorry, but she's not allowed in. And so the gentleman that I were with, with the partner organization said, no, no, she's on our list. Like she's an invited guest. And they named who our host was at the Saudi Olympic Committee. Um, so they're like frantic, these guys at the security thing, they're like, uh, no, 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 no women are allowed here. No women are allowed here. So they're on the phone, they're calling our host. And finally our host says, no, no, she's with us. Um, let her in. And they were mortified because women in the Saudi context weren't like there was no, so we went in for meetings and we were there for maybe three hours. And so in this meeting, the conversation was about a helping to start a women's like a girl's physical education program in their schools so that girls could be introduced to physical activity because of the the drastic number um and just obesity rate and and the things that come with that high diabetes heart disease all of that so it was about a physical education program but then it was also to really press and challenge them to put forth a female saudi Olympian to compete so that their men's team could compete and so that they could demonstrate a commitment to gender equity or at least gender movement. Sure. Um, so that was the purpose of our meeting. And so while I was in there, we were in there all morning. They gave us water and coffee and tea and everything. And eventually I'm just going to be super transparent. I hope it's okay. I had to pee. <laughs> And so I said, oh, is there I'm a already, restroom for you? I'm like, I'm really sorry, but I need to use the toilet, like the, the restroom. You should have seen their faces, Erica. Like all of the hosts were like, <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't have a women's restroom here. 
well, there's nowhere for you. You're going to have to wait. And I was like, I can't wait. So the guy, like the hosts, the tea, the like everybody were scrambling. And, and in fairness to their like faith beliefs, they didn't want a woman to use the men's restroom. Mm. I'm being super like transparent in case I was menstruating and to mm. defile that space. So okay. there was a huge cultural class and understanding there. Um, so I, you know, I learned a lot through that too. And just like, okay, how are we respectful of this yet also push so that women in Saudi Arabia have the opportunities. I met with a woman there uh, who was the wife of someone that worked at the Olympic committee and her job, she had a job and she was so proud of her job was to give identity cards to women um, just so they had their own identity. And she just bawled and cried and cried and cried and said, I love my job because women, no matter if they are standing next to a man or going out with a man or they have to travel with a man, they at least have a card that says, I am human. And if this is what I can do to advance the rights of women in my country, I am so proud to have this job so they don't feel forgotten or unseen. So those are some of the like cultural things and doors that sport opens. And thanks God, Saudi did put forth a woman in, in uh, equine for the Olympics. Uh, and they continue to make strides. They've started physical education programs. Women are exposed to physical education. Girls are, um, and sport is opening up. So I think it's the battle but not a conflicting battle. It's the battle on behalf of all of us to advance um, the needs of what make our societies the strongest and the best that they can be. And I think it's doing that with sensitivity and love and care and humor. Um, and, you know, like, like, hey, I got to pee. What's a girl do when she's got to pee? <laughs> so it's very clear to me, empowering girls and women in and through sport has been a major thread in your career. And I also know that doing the same for refugees and people with disabilities has also been majorly um, evident in, in your journey. Can you talk to me a little bit more about why refugees and why individuals with disabilities have been important to you and perhaps important to the center's work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um... You know, it's identifying the marginalized communities and persons where there seems to be larger gaps than other marginalized communities where people are working alongside. And so I have found in our research and just global work in now more than 115 countries um, that refugees and displaced persons, there is still a huge gap uh, especially as it relates to uh, sport and physical activity as a human right, because, and rightfully so, we we really focus on like food, shelter, uh, security, and those are primary needs. But I think oftentimes what gets lost is the socio-emotional needs which are equally as important as our physical needs and the infrastructure around us. Um, and so if we think about in, in the sport for development context, there are very few um, mechanisms that are more low cost, high impact, and just the body is designed to move and kids and young people are designed to play, to express themselves. And going back to the Iranian context, it's about autonomy, right? So when you play and you have the freedom to move your body and express yourself and just um, engage with other people in, I'm not talking competitive sport, I'm talking just the act of playing together. Um, it gives us a sense of autonomy and wholeness uh, that very few other things do that at really relatively low to no cost. And so I think that's why I've always had a heart for refugees and displaced persons, just understanding that that real basic human need and right gets lost um, in the hierarchy of assumed needs. Um, whereas I would, I would put those at the same level, right? Like 
So, um, and then persons with disabilities, you know, I think about, especially women uh, with disabilities, you know, they're double or triple marginalized because persons with disabilities typically are from lower socioeconomic means um, or because of their disability really struggle socioeconomically. Uh, and so I think they just happen to be a double or triple, triple marginalized part of our communities where accessibility is so dependent on, on infrastructure and infrastructure is so dependent upon the economic means of a community or a country. And so when you think about providing accessible sports spaces, even a ramp to get in a place or an elevator, um, there are real physical challenges, again, that kind of Heisman people that just can't access those places, places whether they're blind or deaf or a wheelchair user or a crutch user. And so I think, um, and again, it goes back to autonomy and control over your own body that oftentimes, as expressed by the people that we work with, persons with disabilities, to have control over their own body and to feel the autonomy and independence of their own body, having lost part of that autonomy over their own body is critical to their socio-emotional health. Um, and they have so much to offer. It's just the environment that doesn't provide the accessibility for them to do it. So those are, I, I think, the driving forces behind those, why those two communities in particular are, are such a passion point for me. Mm, well, thank you on behalf of the world for doing that work. I know you're not alone, but you've certainly spearheaded oh. so many things and spearheaded mm -hmm. the center and... I would imagine you taught yourself a lot of skills in this process or other cultures and other experiences taught you things. I, I'm i wondering more about that evolution of your professional identity and your professional skills, especially how I see you as entrepreneurial. Of course, you've received these several degrees, including a PhD, but that's probably not going to teach you how to sit at the table in Saudi Arabia and get from A to Z in a certain conversation. So are there any kind of professional muscles or skills that you think have really served you well? And um, kind of any tips on how other people could build those muscles if they're seeking to enter the sector? Sure, uh, it's a great question. And it's hard to like uh, autopsy those kind of skills <laughs> and where you come from, like to really, I mean, it's the soft skills that are hard to articulate. Yeah. I think for me, um, and for better or worse, it's the power of um, of metaphor for me. Like for me, the the world is really built on metaphor. So I often there's a and there's a few cliches that we've come up with, and I'll give you a few. So just metaphorically speaking, um, I see sport as my superpower, and so in in like in superhero movies, a superpower in the hands of a hero can be used to save uh, and to like bring dignity and hope to a community. But that exact same superpower in the hands of a villain, right? So if the villain gets a hold of the superpower, they use it to cause destruction. And so for me, it's the power of this metaphor that I hold this thing that is really neutral in my hand called sport. And I can either choose with intentionality to use it to help empower the communities and, and work alongside the communities and build up the communities and, and the people that I work with and try to educate and inspire to have sport be used in the hands of a villain to cause destruction. And I don't even mean like intentional destruction. I just mean missing the opportunity to be intentional, to do something super positive to me. Like there is no real neutrality there. So the power of metaphor for me in my professional life has been really important to kind of take these things and make it real because sport in and of itself is neutral. It It's in the hands of who does what with it. The other is, um, which is kind of a tagline that we've come up with recently is that social change is a team sport, which is another kind of metaphor. But when I think about the power of a team and I think about like, I would never put five point guards onto the court 
and expect to beat the University of Tennessee or UConn or University of South Carolina, right? Because five point guards don't have the skill set to defeat a worthy opponent. And social change is the same way. It's not just about the starting five. It's about the depth of the the bench and the diversity of skills and experiences and maturity and everything that is represented within that. So it's kind of another like powerful metaphor and cliche that we hang on to. Then uh, the other, and I think you read this in the bio that the mission of the center is used to, is to use the power of sport and education to create a more inclusive, equitable, and um, peaceful world. And that's a like fine academic statement. But when we scale it back and our team gets together, we're like, ah, actually our mission statement is just to change the world one high five at a time. Mm -hmm. And so you think about what a high five means, right? It's simple, but it's deeper meaning is vulnerability, connection, touch, uh, understanding, meeting someone like halfway. So there's a lot of metaphors in that too. So I would say professionally, I lean on um, the power of, of metaphors and things that, um, you know, that make it simple to take these like really complex social issues and global issues, um, really drill them down into the simplest thing. And like, if I can change the world one high five at a time, that's doable. And I can do that. I can give every single person I know a high five and that is a good start. That's so nice. And so, yeah, I, I, I wasn't expecting that the metaphors, but I know you have mantras like in my <laughs> mind. So yeah, the metaphors are much more advanced. And as you hinted at can transcend different groups and potentially different languages, because I know something about you or from what I've observed, just your way with words can be very, very clear. And that's so useful in these different spaces when maybe English mm -hmm. is not something people are comfortable with. So it's not only use a metaphor but a metaphor that can gather momentum and kind of meet someone where they're at is is so powerful so i love that skill that you've developed <laughs> well thank you i and i you know i'm so grateful for all the people in my life um around the world that have contributed to that i would say probably the greatest lesson in the power of communication was when um, the the National Olympic Committee in Iran and the Islamic Federation of Women's Sports in Iran asked me to start fast pitch women's softball in the country. So let me just give some context. Softball is a very, very, very American sport. It had never been seen or taught or mentioned in the history of the Persian Empire, which goes back like thousands of years. So I was so confused. Uh, softball had been taken out of the Olympics. And I was like, okay, it's out of the Olympics. It's a diehard American sport. Why are they asking me to introduce women's fast pitch softball? So I went, I took equipment donated from the University of Tennessee women's softball team, crates and crates and crates and went, showed up. I had no idea what to expect. I was like, less than 30 years old when we started this project, um, showed up in a university classroom where women were studying physical education. And they were my first students, like the first softball class. So they had never seen a softball. They had never heard of softball and they had no starting point contextually. So think about the complexities of the game of softball. <laughs> We had to start with like the basics of, okay, here's the equipment, here's the field, here's the rules, here's the concepts, here's the strategies. So in Farsi and English, I had to become an incredible communicator, understanding that like it, it would be the equivalent of Elon Musk putting me in a rocket ship right now and saying, okay, go <laughs> do it, fly to the moon go, go, go to Mars, go. I'm like, what is this? I've never seen it. I don't know the names of it. I don't know how any of it works. So it taught me to break things down from a, um, don't make any assumptions that there is any prerequisite knowledge and 
and figure it out. And so it wasn't just me figuring it out for them. The key was figuring it out with them. Mm. So, okay. So just let me break it down. The game is called softball. Erica, you know, this is the ball soft. (laughs) No, not even a little bit. And I don't know how to explain that to anybody. (laughs) Anybody. So the first day I'm teaching soft ball and Farsi to English is soft. The ball is soft. So they get a ball and what do they do? They start throwing it at each other. So there's busted eyes, lips, bloody noses. So the first day of class, there's like blood everywhere. Oh my gosh. Because we're teaching soft ball. So we had to come up with another name for the game in Farsi that said, this is a game with a large ball, right? (laughs) So like those types of communication skills where we scale back all of our assumptions, all of our predetermined ideas of our worldview from where we're coming from, and we listen and we try to figure out and empathize with where someone else sees the world. And what their context is, was my greatest teacher. That was more valuable to me than a PhD times 10. Wow. Wow. Well, I played softball at my university and I do not think that would have equipped me for one day in what you did. So I am wowed and uh, what an experience that, that, as you said, taught you these ways of communicating concisely and meeting someone where they're at and just fine, not making any assumptions. Yeah. 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 So here's this, the sweet thing. And I am so proud of the Iranians. There are still 15 teams, not individuals, teams. We started from zero, 15 women's softball teams that are still playing today. A few years ago, they competed in their first ever international softball competition. So I'm so proud of them. What a legacy. Dr. Sarah, is there anything that's important to you from your career or from your learnings that we haven't talked about that you wanted to share? We say this a lot to our GSMP, the Global Sports Mentoring Program from the State Department, which I'm so grateful for that relationship and that partnership. It's 10 years now, which is hard to believe, as well as with uh, ESPNW. But uh, we always talk to the 232 now alums that have gone through the program, but we really uh, establish a framework of identifying what are you passionate about? So what is your passion? So a passion in the ways that we articulate it is what wakes you up in the morning? So excited. Like if you could do anything every morning that excites you, that you can contribute and feel whole and fulfilled, what is your passion? Or conversely, um, because sometimes it manifests itself in this way is, Um, your passion sometimes manifests as what keeps you awake at night, what burdens your heart and your soul and your spirit um, that you're so passionate about that you can't rest. So it's either an excitement or a restlessness. So what is your passion? Secondly, what is your platform? And I think oftentimes we think in order to make a difference in the world, we have to have some like fancy platform, this high level platform, a PhD, uh, which is highly overrated, I should say. Um, But like, you know, like we have to have some position of power or prestige to have a platform that matters. And uh, we do not believe that is the case. Our platform is any and every person around us that is in our circle of influence is the platform. And if we can change one, that by simple math, by the multiplier effect, we can change many. So your passion, identifying, truly knowing what your passion, truly understanding your platform and how you leverage or are intentional about your circles of influence. And thirdly is your purpose. What is the purpose of your life? If you have to define it, that is something larger than your individual self. What is your purpose that is larger than just you that you want to do? In other words, your legacy. So I would say the only thing is, you know, if you can throughout our lives, 
continue to reflect on your passion, your platform and your purpose. And at each stage of our life, those things transform and morph and they should grow um, as we grow. But if we can continue to challenge ourselves and reflect on those three things and then think intentionally about, okay, what do I do with that? Because every single thing we do matters. When we don't do anything, it also matters. So passion, platform, and purpose. Now that we know more about our guest's career journey, the rest of our conversation will allow us to have some fun and get to know our guest on a personal level through some rapid fire questions. We'll then start to wrap up with pointed questions focused on advice and how our listeners can transform interest into action. Enjoy the rest of the conversation. Dr. Sarah, what's your favorite city? Ooh, all right. I'm going to have to go. It, it might be hotly co- contested. Whew. Okay, it's either Tehran mm-hmm. or um, Jerusalem, which are like two like opposite ends of the spectrum. <laughs> I think Jerusalem in the sense that like there's so much of the world's focus and like faith intersections. Mm-hmm. And for me personally, as a follower of Christ, like, and understanding the love of Christ and that, that the city was not intended to be for one uh, belief system. So I, I think like Jerusalem, maybe for me um, with hopes that the Prince of peace and the power of peace can prevail for all faiths is probably my favorite. What's your favorite music to dance to? Oh my gosh. Listen, I love to dance to anything. So I've been doing a lot of country line dancing lately. So I'm good with country, uh, (laughs) but I'm also good with like some old school throwback, like 80s, 90s, like, yeah, like boy band kind of, yeah. All right. But bring it, I'll dance to anything. (laughs) Do you have a guilty pleasure? Um, Guilty pleasure. I mean, I do love to go to the mall every week and get an acupressure 30 minute massage from my Chinese friends for like $32 an hour. That is my guilty (laughs) pleasure. And we speak Chinese together and uh, have a blast. Is there uh, any advice you would give to someone who is dreaming of breaking into the sport for development and peace sector and making it a career? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, okay. So if you follow our social media um, at the Center for Sports, Peace and Society or the Global Sports Mentoring Program, you're going to see a lot of like super sexy, awesome, world changing content, right? And it is going to look so sweet and so life changing and so sexy, which is true. Like it is truly transformative. But I think the truth of the matter is we have a tiny but mighty team behind those scenes that make tremendous personal and professional sacrifices to advance that mission. That if you are getting into this work, don't do it because it's cool or it's sexy or it's um, flashy or it's great for your social media. At the end of the day, if you're going to commit to this work, It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of tears. So every morning that I wake up, I wake up to dozens and dozens of WhatsApp messages um, asking for help, crying out for help, um, or saying, uh, I'm so excited. I want to share this with you. But there is never a moment of rest. Um, Social change and creating a more peaceful, equitable, and inclusive world is not going to happen within my lifetime. Erica, it's not going to happen within your lifetime. And there have been people fighting on behalf of, of these issues for generations. It is not going to happen. Um, So I think having a realistic perspective that if you choose a career that is in service to something larger than yourself, um, that you're willing to put in the hard, hard work, willing to make the sacrifices 
and understand that it's not as glamorous as it seems on social media. And so do it for the right reasons, because it's your calling, because it truly is your passion. It is a platform that you can leverage. And it is the purpose that you want to pursue because it's something larger than your own individual needs or desires or pursuits. So that would be my advice. Mm. Well, I'll be sure to put in the links to the show notes for GSMP and the center. Are there any ways that our audience can support you or your work moving forward, Dr. Sarah? Yeah. Okay. So behind your right shoulder is our book, Strong yes. Women in Better World. <laughs> We wrote a book in celebration of the 50th anniversary of Title IX, but also the 10-year anniversary of the center. We wrote about nine women in, in honor of, of Title IX around the world from nine different countries that are fighting for gender equity and their own Title IX moments. And so we're so grateful to the National Hockey League for being our title sponsor of the book so that 100% of the proceeds from the purchase of the book go to support uh, women. Uh, I think we have 160 something from 90 countries now that are fighting for gender equity. So 100% of the proceeds go to create uh, a grant making program to support their work globally. And that's one really easy, tangible way. Great. Great. Well, my final question that I love to ask all my amazing guests is who or what inspires you? <laughs> okay. So, you know, my personal faith perspective. So like the love of Christ inspires me a ton. And, and I think oftentimes that gets lost in, um, in being misunderstood as religion. And I'm talking about a relationship with a loving savior um, who is unconditional that it is not based on any condition of our humanity whatsoever. So for me, if I can love um, every single person I, may, I meet unconditionally and help them realize the value of who they are, not because of what they do, where they're from, what they make, what they do for who they are and who God created them to be, that would be my ultimate inspiration. Wonderful. And I do invite people to say something in a different language. I imagine you have little bits and lots of languages. Is there anything that would be a nice wrap up on this call? <laughs> <laughs> so many, right? Uh, I just got off a, full, a phone call with um, some Afghan girls basketball players that we worked with Equality League um, to help rescue from the Taliban. And their only crime was a pursuit of education and basketball. They've been living in Albania for 15 months. We have successfully advocated for their resettlement in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, so we're going to have 15 new babies, uh, ages 17 to 35 coming um, with hopes that, uh, that the University of Tennessee will continue to provide educational opportunities and basketball opportunities. So all this in the name of language. Um, I just got off the call with them and said, which means I love you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Inspira podcast with Erica Mueller Chen. I really hope you enjoyed the episode and found it useful. Be sure to check out the show notes for links and resources. Specifically, my link tree is there with tons of awesome information. Feel inspired to take action today? I've got three action steps you can take right now because you know your girl likes calls to action and the number three. So here goes. Number one. Follow the podcast on your chosen podcast platform. Number two, share your feedback with me through the listener survey listed on that link tree. And number three, tell just one friend about this podcast so they can give it a listen to. And do I have any overachievers out there? I've got a bonus action step, which is to consider supporting me and making sure this passion project prospers. So number four, follow the link to buy me a coffee. That would be pretty amazing. Until next time, stay inspired.